Now to a very illuminating experiment, discriminating against others on the basis of their eye colour. You'll have heard of this. It's an exercise to illustrate racism that's reverberated around the world ever since it was first used in a small town American classroom more than 40 years ago. The woman behind the brown eyes, blue eyes experiment is Jane Elliott. And if you think she might be taking it easier nowadays, you'd be wrong. Jane Elliott says the fight against racism is far from over. She joined me during a visit to Australia last August. Well, thank you. Now, there's a black man in the White House now, but has much really changed in the US? Yes, it's gotten worse. You see, there's the fear among many white people that if this one black man shows this kind of intelligence, might it be true then that there are a lot of black men who are smarter than the white males have been willing to admit that they are? This is a scary time for white people in my country. They, the southern white legislators, are absolutely determined that this black man will not have a second term in the White House, and they have said so. And they say it's not because of the color of his skin. It's because of other factors. Well, the color of his skin is what they see first, and it's what they are most upset by. Is this true, though? I mean, this can't be true for all white people in America. Surely this is a minority. It, it is a very vocal minority. It's a very vocal and very angry minority. And there are many of them in the Congress of the United States who have said, this man will not be allowed to succeed. I have never heard this <laughs> in all the years I've been watching politics and been involved. I have never heard this kind of bias toward the President of the United States before. Yes. A former Prime Minister of ours, John Howard, said something along the lines of that it, this didn't mean much for Australians to have an African-American in that job. Quite a few people didn't agree with that statement. It, it was seen as a symbol of hope and of change, even here. What do you think? John Howard said a lot of things that were not quite right, and that was one of them. The fact that that black man is the President of the United States is important to every person on the face of the earth because we, we consider the United States the leader of the free world. And now the leader of the leader of the free world is a black man. That sends tremendous hope. It's like a wave throughout the nations. Here is a black man who succeeded in spite of all the obstacles we placed in his path. And we white folks in the United States know how to mount obstacles in your path. And I'm one of them. I'm fully aware of what racism looks like, what it feels like, what it acts like. And I see racism in the reaction to every sentence this man says and every action he takes. And we absolutely, as a nation, for the most part, have refused to recognize or to acknowledge the things that he have done, has done that have been very positive since he became president. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I suppose the, the, the minority, angry minority group that you've already touched on aside, is racism among other people more hidden or, or more insidious, less open? Well, see, be. you see, if you're, if you're a white person, you don't recognize it. But if you're a person of color on whom that racism is being visited on a daily basis, you recognize it immediately. There is no doubt in your mind but what that statement that was just made was a racist statement. If you're gay and lesbian, you recognize homophobia when you see it and when you hear it and when you're on the receiving end of it. But if you aren't part of that group, you don't recognize what's really happening. And we say things that are totally, absolutely racist and it doesn't occur to us that what we just said should never have come out of our mouths. So you're saying that all white people are like this? or I'm saying that in the United States, I don't know about all white people, but I do an awful lot of work in the UK and I do occasionally, I work in Australia and I'm going to an international conference on race to speak in Germany in two, three weeks. Now I don't believe they'd be having me come in there unless they saw a problem. And I think there is a problem, and the problem is not skin color. The problem is ignorance about the unimportance of skin color as a way to determine the worth of a human being. Ignorance is the problem we have, and the answer to that, of course, is education. But in my country, I don't know about every country in the world, but in my country, white people have the power. They have the power to stop this situation. They also have the power to perpetuate it, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is, this is, of course, a cultural issue, isn't it? I mean, I, I remember talking uh, to scientists years ago saying, you know, from a, from a biological point of view, if you look at the genes, race is effectively a non-existent thing. It's a cultural construct. 
right. cultural constructs are extremely powerful. It's a social construct that came up when white people started, you know, navigating the globe and found people who were different from themselves physically, didn't understand the differences, so they started categorizing people on the basis of physical characteristics, just as Linnaeus was categorizing plants. It was a bad idea. It was an idea of ignorance. But these were scientists, so we thought, everybody thought they must know what they were doing. They were wrong. There's only one race. It's the human race. Human beings come in different sizes and shapes and colors and genders and, and sexual orientations. But we're all members of the same race. We've got to get rid of the idea of racism. We've got to start talking about colorism because that's what, that's what it's about. If we talk about your, your scenario, the, the brown eyes, blue eyes exercise, the brown eyed participants are the comfortable and privileged of the group and the blue eyed people cop it. What's a good outcome at the end of this? I mean, you must have seen just about everything by now. Oh, yeah, I've seen fantastic outcomes. I've seen a Vietnam veteran crying because he said, I did not know. I had no idea. I was sure I wasn't a racist. My God, what have I done? I've seen um, <laughs> local sheriffs say, things will change in our county. Things will change drastically. We will not allow these attitudes to be perpetuated anymore. But attitudes aren't the problem as far as I'm concerned. Behavior is the problem. I don't care what your attitude is. It can't hurt me. I care what your behavior is. And we can legislate behaviors. We can legislate our way out of racist behaviors. And if you stop acting like a racist, people might stop treating you and regarding you as a racist, and then we can turn this thing around. Nobody's born a bigot. You have to learn bigotry. And unfortunately, in the schools in my country, we teach racism on a daily basis. On Life Matters today, my guest is Jane Elliott, the creator of the Brown Eyes, Blue Eyes exercise, which she, she first used 40-odd years ago in America and is still using. It's become her life's work, in a way. Here you've adapted the experiment to focus on the inherent racism against uh, Australian Aboriginals. Were you surprised by what you found? I was the first time I did that exercise in Australia. I was absolutely blown away. And the film that we made in Australia a couple of years ago, several years ago, has been something that has stayed with me and will stay with me forever because in that film, in that group, there were members of the stolen generation. Yes. And those people had the courage to step forward and explain in a kind and gentle way what their lives had been like as a result of the racism brought to this country by white people. I will never forget that. I will, that is one of the greatest learning experiences that I've ever had. Because there those people were who had been so grossly mistreated. They themselves and watch these, these blue-eyed participants say all the things that they've said all these years about not being racist, and after all, this isn't a problem of racism, after all these people, oh, they said terrible things. And those, those brown-eyed aboriginals sat there and listened to that and then explained to them gently and kindly and determinedly what it was that they took issue to and what they had just said. And then finally this one woman said, you don't even have to listen We've gone through this and we're telling you this and you don't even have to listen. She was talking about the power of the blue-eyed people, mm. the power of the blue-eyed people outside that room, which they were still exercising in that room during that exercise. That it was, was amazing. I think this goes back to about 2002 or perhaps yes. even just a little before that. The film came out in 2002. Mm -hmm. right. Do you think things have changed at all here in that time? I haven't been here often enough to know. Well, nowadays, I would, hope, I would hope that they have. I hope they. I hope it's better. If it isn't better, how long, oh Lord, will you expect these native inhabitants to put up with this? The other thing, of course, is that we have more recent immigrants with even darker skins, and they often bear the brunt of of, of racial prejudice. And and of course, a, around the Western world, since September 11, Muslims can cop it too. Are there any signs of hope, as far as you can see? Well, in my country, there won't be signs. I don't know about your country, but in my country, there won't be signs of hope until we do away with things like no child left behind in the schools. Until we stop teaching that if you're in a shop class, you're less intelligent than those who are, in, are headed for college.
until we stop teaching that you can't expect a whole lot of children of color because you know how they are, until we stop insisting on reading, writing, and arithmetic and not dealing with those other things that are so important. I talked to a child, a fourth grader in California last week, and I said to him, um, what kind of map do you use in your social studies? He said, we don't have social studies. I said, well, what do you mean you don't have social studies? Don't you have map study? No. Well, why not? All we study is LA and reading and arithmetic. I said, reading and mathematics. I said, LA, language arts, reading and arithmetic. Why? He said, because we have to pass those tests. He said, they teach us the test every day. We get taught the test. Now, we are, we are severely limiting our education to reading, writing, and arithmetic. We're going to turn out a generation or two generations of children who know how to run a computer but no, don't know how to relate positively to human beings who are different from themselves. And that ought to be part of the curriculum. These, are, these core skills to pass tests very controversial here at the moment as well. Oh, as I, I hope they won't let that happen. I hope the teachers will, will get up in arms and say, no, there is a whole lot of curriculum that has to be taught here. And this is reading, writing, and arithmetic. Are, those things are only part of the curriculum for human beings. We uh -huh. aren't teaching machines. You're, you're obviously here to talk to Australian teachers. Is there a place for your exercise in classrooms for children as young as eight, I, I, even though we are a more diverse society than when you first ran this exercise 40-odd years ago? People always ask me that, and my answer is always the same. If there's a place in the classroom for the skin color exercise, then there's a place for the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. But it has, but you will not learn to stop doing the skin color exercise until you allow children and teachers to walk in the shoes of a person who is different from themselves. That first class of yours that experienced that exercise, they're now, because uh, that was 1968 or so, they're now 50, give or take a year. How do you like to think they remember you and, and that experience? Well... My daughter put me on Facebook several months ago. Not the nicest thing she ever did to me. But I've had lots of those students write to me on Facebook and say things like, you're the best teacher I ever had. I've had lots of those students come to me during the summer when they see me someplace and say, you're the teacher I remember the most. You taught me the most. I'll never forget the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. And if you look at the film, A Class Divided, you'll see those students as adults, young mm. adults, discussing how they feel about the exercise, how they felt about the exercise 12 or 15 years later after they went through it. It literally changes their lives. When you did this exercise, of course, you probably didn't imagine that it would oh, become I, your life's work. I had no idea. I had no idea. If I had known what was going to happen as a result of that exercise, I probably wouldn't have done it. If I had known that my four children who went to school in that system were going to be spit on, their belongings were going to be destroyed, they're going to be verbally and physically abused by their peers, by their teachers, and by the parents of their peers because I was their mother. If I had known that was going to happen, I wouldn't have done that exercise. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I did not realize the level of racism in all white, all Christian Riceville, Iowa. But and I, when I found out, I was absolutely shocked and so disappointed. But you still do it. It's clearly very important, and all it takes... For evil to happen is for good people to do nothing. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's easy to do nothing. And then you don't have to be responsible for anything. Just stand back and watch it happen and say, I didn't do it. And that's what we do in my country. And that's what you do in your country. And you say, I didn't do it. Somebody else did that. I'm not the one who, who stole those children and forced them to stay away from their families and give up their families for years. I'm not, I'm not the one who did that. Don't blame me. I'm not re responsible for, for the mistakes of the past. We love to say that. No, we aren't responsible for the mistakes of the past, but we are responsible for what we do in the present because what we do in the present constructs the future, and we need to be very, very careful. Well, I think you've made everybody hearing this today a bit more mindful. Jane, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for calling me. Jane Elliott, who continues to travel the world doing the brown eyes, blue eyes exercise with new audiences. Next on Life Matters... We're going on a journey.